For context, and in case you are yet to read it, I am going to read out J.K. Rowling's Twitter feed from yesterday and the tweet that went viral, where she responded to a person who had asked her several questions on a thread accusing her of avoiding answering on the subject of transgenderism. And if you've already seen it and wish to skip ahead, then there are timestamps in the box. So here goes. She said, I believe a woman is a human being who belongs to the sex class that produces large gametes. It's irrelevant whether or not her gametes have ever been fertilised, whether or not she's carried a baby to term, irrelevant if she was born with a rare difference of sexual development that makes neither of the above possible, or if she's aged beyond being able to produce viable eggs. She is a woman, and just as much a woman as the others. I don't believe a woman is more or less of a woman for having sex with men, women, both, or not wanting sex at all. I don't think a woman is more or less of a woman for having a buzz cut and liking suits and ties or wearing stilettos and mini dresses for being black, white or brown, for being six feet tall or a little person, for being kind or cruel, angry or sad, loud or retiring. She isn't more of a woman for featuring Playboy or being a surrendered wife, nor less of a woman for designing space rockets or taking up boxing. What makes her a woman is the fact of being born in a body that, assuming nothing has gone wrong in her physical development, which, as stated above, still doesn't stop her being a woman, is geared towards producing eggs as opposed to sperm, towards bearing as opposed to begetting children, and irrespective of whether she's done either of those things or ever wants to. Womanhood isn't a mystical state of being, nor is it measured by how well one apes sex stereotypes. We are not the creatures, either porn or the Bible tell you we are. Femaleness is not, as trans woman Andrea Chu long wrote, an open mouth, an expectant asshole, blank, blank eyes, nor are we God's afterthought, sprung from Adam's rib. Women are provably subject to certain experiences because of our female bodies, including different forms of oppression depending on the cultures in which we live. When trans activists say, I thought you didn't want to be defined by your biology, it's a feeble and transparent attempt at linguistic sleight of hand. Women don't want to be limited, exploited, punished, or subject to other unjust treatment because of their biology, but our being female is indeed defined by our biology. It's one material fact about us, like having freckles or disliking beetroot, neither of which are representative of our entire beings either. Women have billions of different personalities and life stories which have nothing to do with our bodies, although we are likely to have had experiences men don't and can't because we belong to our sex class. Some people feel strongly that they should have been or wish to be seen as the sex class into which they weren't born. Gender dysphoria is a real and very painful condition and I feel nothing but sympathy for anyone who suffers from it. I want them to be free to dress and present themselves however they like and I want them to have exactly the same rights as every other citizen regarding housing, employment and personal safety. I do not, however, believe that surgeries and cross-sex hormones literally turn a person into the opposite sex, nor do I believe in the idea that each of us has a nebulous gender identity that may or might not match our sexed bodies. I believe the ideology that preaches those tenets has caused and continues to cause very real harm to vulnerable people. I'm strongly against women's and girls' rights and protections being dismantled to accommodate trans-identified men for the very simple reason that no study has ever demonstrated that trans-identified men don't have exactly the same pattern of criminality as other men, and because however they identify, men retain their advantages of speed and strength. 
In other words, I think the safety and rights of girls and women are more important than those men's desire for validation. I sincerely hope that answers your questions. You may still disagree, but as I hope this shows, I'm more than happy to have this debate. Whew. And so am I, my dears. So am I. Welcome to the broadcast, my dear old Faroots, my darlings. Wonderful to see you. It has been the most sublimely gorgeous day here in the kingdom. Cold, but sunny and very refreshing. A totally gorgeous spring day here. Don't you think my fellow Britishers? Ooh, stunning. So I'm in a wonderfully mellow mood. And today we are not focusing on matters royal. I was going to weave them into the topics today, but I'm going to save that and go off topic today. For those of you who prefer me to discuss more weighty matters, some of which we've already discussed, but also some new ones, including the furore over J.K. Rowling of late, that is mainly what we'll be discussing today. So if you don't like me ranting and raving and getting all my knickers in a twist, or as someone told me, I think you're all fur, fur coat and no knickers river. <laughs> How did you know, my dear? How did you know? Well, if you don't like me getting my fur coat in a twist and no knickers, ha! my legs, my legs go into a twist and out of a twist and a kimbo and all over the place, my dear. But I digress. Uh, if you don't like that, be off with you. The loose. I'm not begging you here to stay. I'm not begging you here to stay. But for the rest of you, welcome to the broadcast. Let's have a fruity old time, shall we? But I wanted to first begin on the subject of this jacket, which is one of my favourites, isn't it, my dears? If you're regular here, you'll know that my, my Red Velvet McQueen number is the, the signature piece for the broadcast. And then this is a close second, I'd say, but I'd also say that it's perhaps a, a viewer's favourite, a viewer's favourite. Divine Velvet thing. It's actually a bit of a tatty state. It's actually second-hand Marks and Spencer, <laughs> according to the label. So certainly nothing posh, my dear. Um, but it's divine. And it came as a two-piece, according to the label. And the colour. Now, this is the thing, because I, sometimes I will mention that I'm wearing a green jacket when I'm wearing it. And I'll get a million comments saying, but it's golden. It's a golden jacket. And then on the previous broadcast, I was told, but it's brown. It looks brown. It's a brown jacket. It's a green jacket. It's just that the colours that I wear always read totally different over the lens. This is why when people ask me, what eyeshadow are you wearing? What lipstick? Then I decline to answer, because what you're seeing isn't what they are. Do you understand, my dear? This is a wonderful olive green with golden undertones, I will say. I'll try and put in a close-up photograph that is rendered a little more truly. But it just goes to show you can't really trust anything you see or believe, my dear. Uh, but it's lovely. And when I win the lottery, my dear, when my ship comes in and I win the lottery, my dream is to have some made up like this. I'm going to take this to Anderson and Shepherd, let's say, and have them rustle up a bespoke number in this precise colour of this uh, velvet. But now you know, it's green, just like my eyes. You see, my eyes are green. Or pond, as one of my unflattering friends puts it. Pond. Well, what if, oh, and I've got another green jacket. This one I picked up today. And you see, this is quite a bright, fresh green. Let's see if I can get it in the light. Another second-hand number. This one was from a charity shop and it was originally by Avu. Avu. Voulez-vous? Je ne sais pas. It's a wonderful forest green and actually it looks a bit chenille but it's not chenille. Uh, it reminded me of the Queen's recent number. Queen Camilla in dark green but I know that on camera it's going to read as almost black and near black. Right that's enough colour talk and on to the more serious subject of J.K. Rowling and cha transgender questions. Marquita, oh, what is this name? Mar Marquita Kmunnikova. Kmunnikova. Marquita Kmun. <laughs> Marquita Kmunnikova. I'm just hazarding a guess, my dear. Let's call you Marky, shall we, my dear? Marky Mark. Dear River. <laughs> 
Please could you express your view on the Scottish hate crime issue and J.K. Rowling's involvement in the debate? But before we go any further, because I've been corrected over this in the past, it is Rowling. It is not Rowling, as in growling, my dear. She doesn't mind how you pronounce it, but it is pronounced Rowling. I love that you always defend the right for freedom of speech, so your thoughts on this matter will be greatly appreciated. Sending lots of warm spring greetings your way, Anne happily reciprocated to you as well, my dear marketer or Marquita. Um, I applaud her stance. Let's just cut straight to it. I applaud the stance of J.K. Rowling. We have watched in real time over the last few years the brainwashing, the brainwashing of friends, of family, of schools, of clinics, of institutions, the entire establishment, the political spectrum from A to Z, the brainwashing of an ocean of this population and many others that tell us now that the sky is green and the grass is blue. And I want to begin by saying that nothing I've seen exemplifies and illustrates this stupidity, this delusion with such vividity as the case of Daniel Radcliffe. And uh, I must confess here and now that I've never seen the rest of Daniel Radcliffe's work. I've never seen him in a, a single other performance. So perhaps he's gone on to develop a great talent and he must have some because people keep rushing to see his performances and I also understand that he is and was very popular and went down very well as Harry Potter. So I hold my hands up, my instinct about him must be wrong, but despite his popularity I always thought that he was hideously miscast from the get-go, hideously miscast. I think it was a travesty of casting. I think he was more wooden than Pinocchio. I think that that woodenness was only matched by Emma Watson, his cohort, because they were both absolutely horrific in those roles. And I'm actually quite surprised that J.K. Rowling stood by those casting decisions, particularly, I should say, of Hermione, who was so endearing in the books, with the wild frizzy hair and the, I can't remember, the buck teeth and the stuff the geeky thing going. And Harry in the books was a character with a little bit of spunk and with a little bit of something more than a sort of look of anxiety the entire time. And very one-dimensional, horrifically uncharismatic actors, in my opinion. It's incredible what they managed to manipulate out of their performances in the editing and in the post-production. But I admit that it baffles me how they were so liked even at the time and even by children, because children can usually sniff out these things better than anybody else. But the reason they were so liked is due in no small part to the rest of the supporting cast who were fabulous and saved the movies. Although the books, of course, uh, are better than the movies. And I should also say at this point that Rupert Grint was the exception to the cast of characters for the children. He was fabulous as Ron Weasley. Wonderful, perfect casting. He's the only one out of the children that I've met in real life, and he was wonderful and good humoured. And as I think I might have mentioned before, he stank of fags. That's the only thing about the boy. Absolutely ponged of cigarettes, and I speak as somebody who has partaken here and there of the odd puff. Uh, but you wouldn't know it by sniffing me. But Rupert Grint, could do with the odd shower a little more regularly, but he was very well cast, my dear. Um, but even the Malfoy child, the boy that played the Malfoy child, even that, I think, was miscast. It would be reductive to say that Daniel Radcliffe owes his career and his wealth solely to J.K. Rowling. Perhaps it would be a little reductive of me. His woke fans, however, swooned, they swooned at Daniel Radcliffe's schooling of J.K. Rowling, of this turf, as people are wont to brand J.K. Rowling and the like.
tough if you don't know, is a trans-exclusionary radical feminist. But Daniel Radcliffe made this statement in 2020 via the Trevor Project, a study in virtue signalling, as it was. A study in virtue signalling, pontificating tripe. Absolute tripe. And I'm still vexed about it to this day, which is why I'm bringing it up as it ties in with what's going on today, four years later. As part of this statement, which I'll flash on the screen, he told us he was learning to be a better ally, and he felt compelled to say something in response to the words of J.K. Rowling. And this message was the crux of his schooling. Trans women are women, he says. Any statement to the contrary erases the identity and dignity of transgender people. Actually, Danny boy, you are the one who is erasing their identity and their dignity by lying about what they are and what they're not and erasing the identity and the dignity of women in the process. You are absolutely shameful and I have no apology for this whatsoever for even if it seems like I'm going overboard, this was a visceral attack on J.K. Rowling, the woman that made him and gave him everything he has. And uh, I think that he is and was an arrogant upstart because to this day there's been no apology for this disgraceful attack on J.K. Rowling. And I think he is an uppity toe rag that deserves dressing down, which is why I am not backwards and coming forwards in saying this. How dare he? He is entitled to these views, by the way. He is entitled to put everything he said on paper, and I wouldn't have a problem with it, even if I disagree with it. What I am complaining about is the fact that he made this statement in response to the words of J.K. Rowling and apologised on her behalf. On her behalf. As part of the Harry Potter franchise. How dare he? Trans women might be a subcategory of women. I can accept that. And I can accept that trans women live as if they are a woman. Totally. And my personal choice, although I don't expect everybody else to go along with my personal choice, my personal choice would be to honour the pronouns that a trans woman or trans man prefers to go by, he or she. I'm not into all this them nonsense. I don't mind indulging a fantasy and going along with he or she, but I'm not into them. I'm not calling and reducing anybody or exalting anybody to them, my dear. Take your pick, he or she. And if you're going to go along with she, I don't expect you to have a great big beard hanging down here and a big bulge in your leggings. Any rational Trans women, by the way, also accept that in exchange for leading a peaceful existence in their preferred gender role, they accept that the general public at large has the right to accept them on those terms or not to accept them. Any reasonable trans person understands and accepts that. But most people, including trans women, distinguish between men masquerading as women and women, the separate category that J.K. Rowling recently described only yesterday on her Twitter when she was forced it yet again. The sex class with large gametes. Trans women are not women. Women are women. Men are men. Trans women are also men but they are also trans women and deserve the respect and dignity that most of us would give them by allowing them to live their lives that way. But it shouldn't be forced upon anybody by law to go along with that indulgence. And if any gender dysphoric man is too fragile to face up to this basic truth, then they are quite simply not psychologically stable enough to make any kind of irrevocable transition. They are not stable enough. A friend's mother once gave me a book with that famous quote, wherever you go, there you are. 
And although I barely remember what was contained within the book, although I did read it, the title of it stayed with me. Wherever you go, there you are. Whether you're fantasizing about escaping to some secluded glen and living your life in the woods, once you get there, my dear, you'll still find yourself there and you won't be able to escape from that. So you've got to sort yourself out. Do you know what I mean, my dear? This is the premise of that saying and that motto. Wherever you go, whether it's here, Australia or the moon, there you are inescapable and you've got to get your head around that when you are facing these gender issues and I can tell you if I sound cold-hearted again it's probably because some sensitive easily triggered soul is listening to this because nobody knows better than I the challenges that gender dysphoria can bring and the, the challenges that gender roles play in this world and the decisions that people have to make regarding transition I can assure you Nobody knows better than me. Now, I'm not saying that I know better than anybody else. I'm saying that out of the bunch that know as well as me, none of them can educate me any further on that subject. I totally understand why some people transition and I totally support that decision wholeheartedly and believe that they should be able to live in dignity and in good health of body and mind and spirit but not at the expense of truth. Daniel Radcliffe apologised in this statement on J.K. Rowling's behalf, on her behalf, this is what still exercises me, to all the people who now feel that their experience of the books has been tarnished or diminished, I am deeply sorry for the pain these comments have caused you. Uh, this makes me furious, furious. This is deeply ingratious. How dare you, Daniel Radcliffe? Radcliffe, how dare you? You twerp. You know, it's rare I go in like this, it really is, but. Judging on this episode, I'm truly sorry to say it about a fellow human being, but he is truly vile. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent underneath it. Never were a truer word said. Vile. And I could understand him biting the hand that feeds him, as he did, if he was making some sort of great stellar point in opposition to something abhorrent that J.K. Rowling had uttered. But all she had uttered were the words that the vast majority of the population agree with, which is that a spade is a spade and a fork is not a spade. Love always, he says, Dan. Love always, Dan. Keep your love. Twisted love. So why does this matter? Because in language, we are dealing with the building blocks of society, my dear, and of civility and of sophistication. It is in the language. And I have no objection to feeding the fantasy. I have great sympathy and compassion for gender dysphoria, as I say. And the likes of Daniel Radcliffe actually insinuate by saying what they do, that it is shameful by not admitting the truth under the guise of caring. You know, they care so much about their beloved fans and they're such great allies for the LGBTQARSE letters community. They're so caring that they're gonna lie to you, lie to you through their teeth. Because don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. Daniel Radcliffe knows. He knows the truth. And as I say, it's a question of civility. No decent person nowadays really wants to go around branding trans women men as if it is some form of merriment and amusement. It's cruel. And most people now are very happy to indulge this and to refer to a trans person, a trans woman, as a woman or as a girl, colloquially, and can even come to think of them as a woman or as a girl but not literally a woman or a girl, not literally the old fashioned definition of literally, not literally, not medically, not biologically. It's a denial of fact.
So that is some of the background that worked me up into a lava. And where we find ourselves this week is J.K. Rowling making headlines in relation to the Hate Crime and Public Order Scotland Act that came into action last week, last Monday, under the Ministry of the First Minister of Scotland, Hamza Yusuf. And it consolidates existing hate legislation and creates a new offence of stirring up hatred against protected characteristics. And this is what all the drama is about. These protected characteristics include disability, religion, sexual orientation, age, transgender identity and variations in sex characteristics. And there's been criticism, including concerns from the Assembly of Scottish Police superintendents that activists could seek to weaponize this legislation to advance their own agendas. This is one of the main complaints. For example, thousands reported J.K. Rowling's recent tweets calling out trans women as men uh, and called for her arrest using this new law as their basis, this new act. And J.K. Rowling said that she is going to be happy to be arrested under it. And she's made a big fuss about it. Police are also apparently untrained in this new law and are confused over what is and what isn't a hate crime, an interpretation. That it will be a way of muzzling and silencing others out of fear. Mr Yusuf, however, claims that J.K. Rowling is spreading disinformation and is being ludicrous. Actually, J.K. Rowling's tweets are a perfect example of how the law actually works. J.K. Rowling produced some tweets that were offensive, that were insulting, but of course the law does not deal with offensive. The law is dealing with new offences, criminal behaviour that has to be threatening or abusive, intent to stir up hatred, hence why she was not arrested. Anybody who actually read the bill will not be surprised that she did not actually get arrested. The threshold for criminality is extremely high. Well, I suppose that's encouraging to hear from Hamza Youssef. I looked up the act to try and make some sort of sense of it, and I see that it includes on the section regarding offences and stirring up hatred. I'm not sure what happened to the word inciting hatred. Now they're using stirring up, which seems somewhat unsophisticated to me, a little dumbed down, stirring up hatred stirring the pot. Inciting, I think, would have been a bit more mature, but okay. Offences and stirring up hatred in that cauldron. A person commits an offence if the person behaves in a manner that a reasonable person would consider to be threatening, abusive or insulting. Now, it's actually the word insulting that I found to be rather subjective in this instance. Because as we all know, people take offence at absolutely anything now. And anything you say can be considered an insult, even if you are telling the truth, as J.K. Rowling has been done. So that gave me some cause for concern to begin with. But there is some good. There are some more encouraging passages in this act. That number 16, the common law offence of blasphemy is abolished, for example. And I found this interesting because English and Welsh blasphemy laws were abolished in 2008. I didn't know how recent this was. 2008! Very encouraging to see that it's now been abolished in Scotland. These statutory and common law offences fundamentally protected certain Christian beliefs and made it illegal to question them or deny them and they were very outdated, these blasphemy laws, not really in actual usage anymore. Most claims were rejected by the High Court, but blasphemy is no longer protected by law in Scotland as well as England and Wales, and I think that that is a marvellous thing. But here at number nine on the matter of whether or not an insult can be deemed to be stirring up hatred, because it says under protection of freedom of expression, discussion or criticism of matters relating to all these items you see here, including transgender identity. But in the next section involving religion, it includes expressions of antipathy, dislike, ridicule or insult. 
which is marvellous and exactly as it should be, but I don't understand why these factors from antipathy to insult can't also be applied to the items we see beforehand in section A, including transgender identity. And I'm not suggesting that ridicule or insult are desirable or acceptable social behaviours, but I'm rather wary of criminalising them without further clarification. So, Marquis to my dear, they are my views on the Scottish hate crime issue as it stands, but so much of it revolves around the act itself and the grey areas in the wording because it's all about what is open to interpretation within the law, isn't it, my dear? And Hamza Youssef is suggesting that J.K. Rowling has got it wrong and that she's overreacting and spreading misinformation about the law. And others are saying that the law is going to make it very difficult for police to do their job, for the general population to know whether or not they can express their opinions and this is my main concern, that when people are ruled with fear, then they don't speak and don't talk and don't say anything, just in case they're going to find themselves locked up and thrown into a cell. So it remains to be seen whether or not J.K. Rowling has overreacted to anything. I don't know if she's overreacting or not. But what I can say is that I'm certainly pleased that the likes of J.K. Rowling are bringing this matter to public attention, highlighting it, along with the common sense views that she has and shares with most of us on men, women and transgender people, human beings, because it appears to be empowering friends and neighbours and the populace from this nation and far beyond to simply state what is real and true, unabashedly, without apology, and I think a few pennies have started to drop with families and mothers and fathers of children and children themselves. I think the penny has certainly begun to drop. And it's probably rather horrifying and sobering for many out there to realise that they have been under a delusion. A total delusion for the past few years. And in some ways, you could say, have been the victim of a widespread propaganda that has gripped this planet in the most sinister way and in many ways like a toxic vine over the last few years. We will shake it free, my dears. We will shake free from it. Linda Anderson Holmes says, Hello, River. Thank you for your views on immigration. <laughs> oh, dear. What you say and what your poster said is very true. I'm in Canada and we have the same problems. Trudeau has allowed millions in. And I've had many comments about this from Canadians chiming with what's going on here, although in different circumstances. You say, I've read that the countries represented by the immigrants have been released from prisons and asylums, which adds a whole other layer of problems. Yes, I was also reading today, as I'm sure many here have in the kingdom, that our prisons and jails are being overtaken by Muslim gangs and prote protection rackets. And if people don't convert to Islam, then they're in deep trouble and not protected. This is what's going on here and the Muslim population has been going up and up and up in jails and prisons as terrorists and potential terrorists have been caged. I come from a family who have sponsored three different nationalities over the years. These were people who were thankful to be here and embraced Canada and its values but also retained their own. I'm frightened by the Western governments who have no regard for their citizens. I believe it's all WEF policies they're following and not the long established values of their own countries. We are in dangerous times, end days. <laughs> I pray for the future of the billions of us who want to live peacefully and in harmony. I love your channel, look forward to your videos. You're so enjoyable to watch and listen to. Thank you, my dear, that's very kind of you. Keep up the good work. Well, I'll try, my dear. Oh, and you put a maple leaf as well, a maple leaf emoji. Canada, oh, Canada. Well, it is a totally different scenario in Canada to here in the kingdom, although there are similar problems. Trudeau, as you might have seen this week, has been admitting that immigration is too high, that the number of newcomers needs to be brought down. Well, good luck with that, 
Mr. Tudo. Good luck with that. Ha! It's rather akin to steering a Titanic into a gigantic iceberg and then suggesting that all hands on deck paper over the crack. That is what, that is akin to, my dear. But he is addressing temporary foreign workers specifically that come into your country and have increased at a rate that he says goes far beyond what Canada has been able to absorb. The number of temporary migrants has more than tripled in the last seven years under his watch, under his watch, and also includes international students. In 2017, 2% 2 of the population of Canada were made up of temporary immigrants, now 7.5%. That's since 2017, so in seven years, 2% to 7.5% temporary immigrants. The, the asylum seekers in, in Canada's case uh, hail from Mexico, Haiti, Turkey, India and Colombia. And I got the idea from your comment, my dear, that we seem to be in agreement about the fact that healthy immigration from all these places and beyond is a constructive thing, uh, can be a magical thing, and something to be embraced. True asylum, healthy immigration is all well and good, but we're talking about the speed, the speed, the numbers, and the consequence, the consequence of it for the harmony of our nations and existing peoples. This is the thing. This is the thing. And on the subject of religion, <laughs> because we're going extremely light-hearted today, aren't we, my dears? On the subject of religion, a user by the name of Algorithmic Generated Word Salad, otherwise known as D, said, All religions are made up, as is the concept of royalty. And I'm not sure if this comment was left to try and ruffle my feathers, my dear, or get under my skin, or if you just wanted to leave your opinion. But all religions are made up, as is the concept of royalty. Well, you might be surprised to know that I totally agree with you, my dear. <laughs> I absolutely agree with you that religion and royalty are inventions of man. Uh, as you might know, I will speak all the time about imagination, that we, uh, aside from our physical cells and the atoms, make up the world well the, the rest of it and everything on a spiritual level is imagination and what we do, do with it my dear and it's about religion and anything beyond that uh, or I should say deity is mystery and I think will always be a mystery I think that is the nature of man that they can only reach out feebly to try and grasp notions of mystery and grasp at touching it and they can't i think we as humanity humanize god and most people when they speak about god cannot help themselves from imagining the fatherly figure or literally the characterization of jesus christ in the case of christianity and we tend to give creative the creative energy wherever we were sourced from human emotions as the Greeks did for their gods and as we all do uh, the theatrical play of the Hindu religion for example that sort of interplay in it seems woven throughout all religions isn't it my dear it offers a struck a structure to organize and make sense of one's life and death but for me that is all it is it's a finger pointing at a structure to try and make sense of life and death and the afterlife. But I can assure you that the wisest sage of any religion, the most devout, Bible-thumping zealot, knows no more about the mysteries of life and of deity than a newborn child and in fact I would wager knows much less than a newborn child I would say that that is likely actually religion is a tool that can help and hinder but it is a tool 
I do not believe that religious texts are the word of a single God. I believe that religion offers a practice and an exercise that can beautify one's life and the life of others. It can also oppress your own life and the life of others, but it can also beautify it tremendously and bring meaning to every action, every breath, every utterance. But all those things are just imagination. But when I say just, imagination is also everything that there is. That is why I think it is life enhancing to put one's imagination to good use. And royalty, what's been conjured up over generations and millennia to offer us what we have today, I think it's a wonderful exercise in the imagination that is life enhancing and brings magic to the world, brings magic to the mundane. This is something else that imagination does. It brings magic. It does, it performs alchemy from the mundane to the magical. So it works for me. Life is a mauvais quart d'heure made up of exquisite moments, isn't it, my dear? And all we can try and do is draw into our experience as many exquisite moments as we can. And I thank you most sincerely for sharing another exquisite moment with me here on the broadcast. Stay royal, stay fruity, and always on royal duty. Ta-ra and toodle pen.